No, seriously. It does not want to cooperate. Is it all good? Sort of. Sorry about the noise there again. Checker space. Okay. Was it empty? Oh, okay. I think it's reading. Or something. Okay. No, I don't. I think you don't copy proper. Oh, okay, copy it again. I can show my presentation in the example. Okay. No problem. So, I want to have a... Uh, is, this, is this working? Yeah, it's working. I want to have a small presentation about parametric modeling. It's a thing I discovered recently, a year ago or so. Uh, it's about building 3D models when you either specify constraints or you build it with uh, like uh, programming and stuff. Uh, has anybody built any 3D objects? Okay, cool, cool, a few people. So, uh, I, used, I used to build the stuff uh, using the Blender and uh, recently I discovered FreeCAD and OpenSCAD which you can do the same thing with them. I mean with uh, FreeCAD at least, you can do direct modeling where you're just extruding shapes. But, uh, you can also use parameters to uh, future-proof your, uh, uh, your works. Uh, direct modeling with the extrusion and the usual stuff, uh, it's fast, it allows more freedom, um, but it's also like messy. It gets, it gets messy quick. Um, uh, parametric modeling is uh, higher quality. It will tell you, for example, if a bolt jumps out of your uh, Say you have a vault, it jumps out of your uh, one of your sides of the 
in closure, let's say. Uh, and it allowed to make uh, more version. For example, if you have like a uh, hair clipper that you design in 3D, and you want to equip it with a uh, bigger uh, motor, for example, and you want to make a pro version, it allows you to easier do that. Like just modifying a few variables and it will be done. Uh, direct modeling uh, software is like Blender 3D, uh, Blender 3D, and uh, Wings 3D, which uh, you use mostly you use extrusion to build your stuff. Um, it's mostly used for uh, building uh, things like uh, I don't know animations, scenes, organic structures, stuff like that. Uh, Parametric modeling, I already mentioned them, FreeCAD, OpenStack. So, uh, I wanted to make like a little enclosure for this project of mine, which is a big bone, it's a small board, and uh, I wanted to add some batteries, but I don't want them to fly like around, so I want to make an enclosure. So, um, the batteries fit under the big bone, as you can see. This is uh, 18, uh, 18 650. It's a standard battery that's usually found in laptop batteries. So you can pick them up from a broken battery. Some of them are still good. Uh, the Beagle Bond has a battery controller, so you just need to wire them up. Maybe put a uh, uh, temperature sensor so uh, they do not overheat and maybe explode. <coughs> uh, I cut the dimensions for my project from uh, a Beagle Bond I know. That you can find on uh, Beagle Bones website, and uh, they actually give you like uh, the whole locations. This is the most important thing: the whole location and the size. Here they are in inches. Uh, I just converted them to millimeters. That's what civilized people use. So uh, yeah, that's what I did. Uh, they also give you like. Some dimensions which are useful. Uh, the maximum height of the board, the well, PCB layers doesn't interest us. Next, the batteries. You can find online dimensions. It's 64 millimeters long, 18 millimeters uh, uh, thick, or in diameter. Uh, so that's the presentation. That's the idea. Here's how I did it. Okay. You move it over. So yeah, uh, this is Frica. As you can see, I started with a, uh, a square. Um, um, it's actually it's a rectangle. Uh, it already has uh, the sides defined as being equal. I just uh, specified that this is a uh, this is called a constraint. This is a uh, length constraint, this is a height constraint, and you can uh, add, I added my constraint bar here, you can add more, more constraints. For example, keeping the sides parallel to each other, so that would be a constraint. Whatever you do to this model, it will never get uh, out of parallel, for example, if you, that's what, what you wish. You can make symmetric, uh, a symmetric constraint, which will uh, uh, prevent your model from uh, becoming asymmetric. Like, even if you wish to do so, it will, uh, it will just uh, spit out an error, so it, it won't get. Uh, it won't get out of your parameters. Uh, let me switch to the next slide. Uh, you can see there that it says uh, uh, this is a uh, parameter, like a constraint solver, and it says uh, the sketch still has two degrees of freedom, which means that it can still be modified, like move the position around, and uh, maybe... No. With, and a rotation. It's rotation and position that we can still modify, so that's two degrees of freedom. And uh, the goal is to eliminate all, all degrees of freedom, if possible, and maybe if necessary. If so, uh, that's the ideal case. And uh, if you specify like uh, the right corner to match this, uh, the, the center of the coordinates, it will uh, uh, say that it's uh, fully constrained. So that's the ideal scenario that you want to arrive to. So yeah, uh, I started sketching some uh, another rectangle to establish the wall thickness of my enclosure. 
and uh, yeah, I'm using another constraint. I'm starting to add constraints to the thickness of the walls. I want them to be two millimeters wide. And it's again fully constrained. And uh, I can extrude this cage. Usually you work in the part design, which acts like a, uh, I don't know, AutoCAD, I guess. Like you design stuff in, in uh, 2D, and then you extrude it and get your uh, shapes out. So that's basically it. Uh, you can see here uh, symmetry. I constrain it to be symmetric. So I also started doing the same thing in uh, uh, OpenSCAD. This one, uh, this this time, I started to with fancier. Uh, OpenSCAD is a language actually, which you can define variables, and you have uh, some basic uh, basic shapes that you can use and build your model. Every time you save, the model is updated, and you get your. Uh, um, model out. Uh, here I use the difference. Actually I made two cubes. One which is the external uh, enclosure and one which I want to like carve out of my main cube. So I move them and I use the difference function and it's just carved out. So I get like a, uh, I don't know, what's this called? Ligan? <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it's a small box, yeah. Uh, a useful trick to use when you don't know exactly what is happening is to use a pound sign in front of your function and it will uh, highlight here with uh, um, pink what exactly did that function do. In this case, you see this is the inner cube. This is the inner cube, which is uh, two millimeter up this cube. And it's, uh, it's the the one that does the difference. Uh, here I'm trying to make some posts so I can screw my, uh, my board. I, already, I think I showed you the mounting holes. There are four mounting holes. And I want to build some posts, some cylinders, with a wide base and uh, a thin head. So I can uh, uh, screw my uh, bigger bone board on top of them and the batteries should be below the rocket. So, I built four of these posts, you can see here, that I translated each, each one. Uh, I used this, uh, this information, the post position, I used it from the, I, I got it from the, uh, from the manual, and I converted it to millimeters, in this case. I translated each of the posts, and made four of them. Uh, you can see, if you're a programmer, you can see that here is pretty inefficient. Um, it's, uh, I'm repeating, uh, I'm, uh, it's not dry, how, uh, how it's usually called. I'm, I'm, repeating, uh, I'm repeating the same uh, procedures over and over. And over. Uh, OpenStub also supports functions. So you can use functions to encapsulate stuff and just call it and it will build you a post. Uh, so yeah, that's what the model looks like. Uh, and that's how you can uh, future-proof your models. Because if I want, for example, to use thicker batteries, I can just uh, adjust the height here. I can just make, make it uh, higher. I just change here the number, for example, 30 millimeters, and it will be higher. Uh, say I want to put the batteries sideways. For example, right now I'm thinking of mounting the batteries like this. Well, it's a big battery. Can I do it? No. So I want to mount three batteries like this. Say I want to do it sideways and mount uh, six batteries. I can just modify uh, the length and the width so it accommodates my batteries. That's what I mean by future proofing. Uh, you can do the same thing with FreeCAD, but you have to actually go in the sketch and uh, change dimensions. So it's the same thing. Uh, in Blender, if it's a simple modification, you could do the same. But if it's a mo more complex, um, uh, a more complex uh, geometric figure, it will take a lot of time. And uh, you'll have a lot of more work to do than changing a simple variable. That's it. Thanks. Oh, by the way, I didn't, uh, even if it seems a little bit complicated, I didn't know how to program in OpenSCAD until this morning. They have a cheat sheet yeah, on, their, on their website and uh, you just scan it with your eyes and they have so few functions that you can just learn it in a couple of hours and be productive with it. 
there are four cycles of, of the law and uh, libraries uh, so that uh, if you want a box uh, there is uh, a, a library for a box. For boxes? For sure, yeah. yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. I just do it from scratch. Can you define functions that are called modules? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, sh I, I was thinking of using one for this style. Because uh, I'm always calling the same cylinder function yeah. with the same height, with the same uh, base radius and the same top radius. And uh, yeah, that's, that's not pretty. Yes, so but it's a good cut. In ZCAD, you, you have to use a spreadsheet. And then you can reference uh, those values from the from the spreadsheet. Yeah, you knew that. That's that's new information. Thank you. Uh, where is? Uh, go on. Doesn't Blender and maybe Cricut also have uh, scripting languages? Uh, Blender has Python. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could you could actually do that. I, I never managed to, to learn it. Yeah. Uh, you have to study a little bit the internals. But basically, you can do the same thing, like creating cubes, translating them. It's it's a little bit similar. Sure. So, so it's portable across tools. I mean, you can take output of Blender and import it in this one, and vice versa. Uh, I know that you can. Uh, well, in this case, you can uh, output. You, you can just compile this source code and output an STL file, for example, if you want to print it. Uh, you can also import it in FreeCAD. But it will lose like all the functions, all the everything, all, all the last. You'll just have to, uh, to add the constraints again on your own. Uh, I don't know about Blender. I don't know if, it's, if you can import it like this. But you can definitely import the STLs in Blender. So you can export it to STL, get it back into Blender. The STL is uh, already late. <laughs> if we import okay. it in Blender, then uh, it should uh, do all operations uh, By the way, we'll try to print this enclosure in the in the hall. If you want to see, come and see this. You're welcome. and he's still in, very much good. Uh -huh. So we'll find out next week, pretty much, okay. for sure. Okay, I will look into it because maybe I can bring some biological equipment, I don't know. We're, we're open to that, really. As in, if we've got the space, we've got, uh, we've got space for more stuff. So, a bit of background about me, uh, current president, general manager, one of the founding members, finished in management as a school, that yeah, horrid experience, uh, worked as a business analyst, web developer, I can say I'm probably a better sysadmin than I'm ever going to be a programmer, because sysadmin seems like fun, programming is actual work. Yeah, I'm a bit lazy. Uh, discovered Frack around 15 kind of clicked with me, haven't been the same since. And I identify as a hacker in the old school sense, MIT and such. So since everybody kind of likes an origin story, about five or so years ago, uh, yours truly kind of wanted to find a space in Bucharest. There were only two that existed. I sent them both emails, uh, model up and not answer for like a month plus. I met them since they're really cool but kind of closed circuit. And Inventaza was, I don't know, 
they had an equipment, not much community around it, and just figured, okay, so we need an actual community makerspace, ha hackerspace. Um, which I started by myself like an idiot. I would not recommend doing it the way I did it. There's, towards the end of the presentation, a lot of lessons learned in how to actually go about setting up a hackerspace properly. Uh, this is not a good way to go about things. I started talking left and right and just trying to find a space. I did find the first spot where I wanted us to have a space, us at that time being me and a couple of friends, uh, was kind of a squat to restore project that some guys from architecture were doing. Uh, that didn't work out exactly well because way too much humidity, we couldn't stay there. But by talking about it and talking about it, you get in touch with various people. So we did actually uh, find a space to be hosted for a while at Universitata Alternativa, it's called. The first two years and a half pretty much were just vaguely testing the idea because the people that were interested most of them didn't have time. Uh, we didn't have actual significant financing and it wasn't really sure if we're going to do something with it or not. Uh, by 2015 we decided, okay, let's make it official because the only way you can get some decent funding is if you have a legal entity. Uh, so we became an engineer in 2015. Spring 2016 saw the first civil war, hopefully the last civil war. Uh, that was out of a bunch of reasons, but communication, lack thereof, and uh, having one individual that was profoundly toxic managed to almost crush it. Just as simple as that. Uh, this year we got a large research project we're part of, Makey, which means makerspaces in early years. Short version, we're going to try to teach kids about science technology using computer games, modular robots and other stuff, like six and seven year olds. Uh, and we're currently about to reopen. But what is Hatch, Hackerspace or Hatch Atelier, that's our Romanian name. Specifically, it's an NGO, Hackerspace, or Makerspace because we don't really limit one or the other. Uh, it's supposed to be participative, transparent, inclusive, open, and definitely more a club than other stuff like that. We have only four, uh, only eight guidelines at this point, which don't think you need a lot more. Be excellent to each other. If you have an interest in projects, try to build, not buy. Support free and open solutions wherever possible. Share your knowledge, don't break the law, obviously. Use tools in a proper way and make sure that you have a clean space. Right, that seems all fine and nice. The thing you're going to get when you're going to have a space like this is there are four major components. The physical space, the people that are there, the infrastructure you have in terms of equipment, finding and so on, and activity, actual activity. If one of these things does not really exist, you don't much really have a hackerspace at the time, which we currently don't really have because we need to open again. Um, you're going to find a few problems trying to open a community space like this. Uh, don't do it like I did it. Find either initially a space where you could start and then start looking for people or get a few people initially supporting this idea together before you do anything else. Otherwise, it will be profoundly aggravating to have people come and go and it will seem like you're not doing much, you're spinning your wheels a lot. So get your minimum support base right off the bat before you launch, before you even design it way too advanced, have the people that will make it sustainable for that level. If you're testing the idea, there's no point in more, most places to start with a legal entity. It will just charge up a lot of costs. If you're serious and committed about it, then do start with a legal entity and spend at least two, three months discussing with the people that will be the initial members how exactly you want it to look like and what exactly the guidelines, the principles behind it are, because this will save you a lot of heartache down the line. Um, 
there's design patterns on hackerspaces.org which are a great place to start. Read them, reread them, have everybody read them. They'll give you a general idea of what other places have tried and has worked with varying degrees of success. It's a very good place to start and hackerspaces.org has a lot of information that's good. Um, right, you're gonna have something, you're gonna notice something if you don't do this very well initially, if you don't design it well initially, you're going to have new people coming in and going, and every time there will be a rehash of what that space is supposed to be. Everybody has an idea and you're going to go back to it and back to it, which is aggravating at least. So that's why you should have documentation. When you have a new member, read it, figure out what it is before you start wanting to change things because most people come to a place and get ideas. Have a bit of time to acclimate what is already there before you let them uh, start messing around with whatever it is. Uh, this is the time probably before you actually launch to go around and try to find some initial sponsorship. If you're already launched, you will have problems with it because a lot of potential sponsors or partners or so on will go, okay, what have you done since you're already in existence? If you go, we want to launch a new space and we're finding sponsors and partners and so on, it will be a lot easier. Um, membership, yes. Chances are if you're going to have a community one, you're going to have to have paying membership. Unless somebody is extremely rich, an angel investor or something like that, you're probably going to have to have a paying membership. Obviously, paying in advance is always better. This is something that you should implement at any place like that. Uh, a good idea is to assume your operational costs should be covered by membership directly by the members. This is for a few reasons. Um, obviously, self-sustainability and independence are the major ones. If you become dependent on somebody else's financing, the second they withdraw it, your whole community kind of goes into death rows and other problems. So sustainability is key. You should be able to su support operational costs by yourself. Uh, one mistake we kind of did, because we wanted it to be as, uh, let's say, open and easy, accessible to people, was that initially we figured out we're going to put the minimum, minimum able pricing just so that it will be accessible. That's again not wise, plan in such a way that you launch, initially you're going to, the initial adopters, the first members will have to probably fork out a bit more and it's better to reduce membership costs later on when you have more members than having to scale up. Psychologically it works way better, people don't get so upset when they're, oh, why? Because it doesn't work. The other thing with members and membership is I would recommend having a trial period or not having full voting rights from the get-go because that does happen. People come in, they don't get exactly what is there, they haven't been around enough to get the flow of things and they suddenly go, oh, you know, but we can do this and this and this and you're like, we thought of that, we've talked, oh, just, just wait. Get a feeling first. And then specifics, bring them up at meetings, that's a lot better way to govern the space. Right. Membership. This sucks, but some people are complete assholes and they're toxic. You need to have from the get-go a mechanism that will be able to pick them up if it happens. Having a trial period also helps that people that don't fit within the community or kind of get self-excluded. They don't like it, they don't stay. Uh, and one thing that will kill a community is when a certain group or a parts of it decide we should change everything and go this way. If that seems to happen, a very good strategy is to support those people but not change the existing organization. Say, okay, let's help you create a new organization to do that while leaving this one alone. If you're going to start a fight between, you might ruin your community. This way, it's a soft hack that works social. 
support it if you can, even if it's not directly with your initial plans, just this way you don't wreck your own community and maybe just a new one appears. Uh, governance, you will need it of some form or another. The reality is we want it to be as democratic as possible. Everybody has an opinion and should be able to express it. But in practice, having a direct democracy does not work well. As in, if all the members have to vote on something, they'll become annoyed. If it becomes an obligation to vote, there will be a lot of stress involved. Um, so if you do make the democracy, make it voluntary participation. If you don't participate, you are practically okay with whatever the rest decide. That is the acceptable uh, kind of balance between the two. You're going to need somebody to be able to have some autonomy to make decisions. If every single decision has to go back through a committee, then you're never going to do anything. So make clear what, what decisions should go back to the members and be uh, passed by them and what is more or less day-to-day -day operations and should be within the autonomy of whoever is mostly managing the space. You should make that rather clear because that also might be a cause for a lot of heartache. Because people don't feel listened to or the other way around or we're not moving, a lot of problems. All right. Either way, once you have an organization, the minimum that you will need will have somebody that will have legal knowledge. You can outsource it, but you will need somebody on legal. You will need somebody for website administration, social, so on. You will need probably a designer at one point. Or This is not necessarily individuals or roles or jobs, but more like things that will need to be done as in roles around an organization. Internal communications as in transferring knowledge to the members and working with other organizations outside. And you're probably going to want to outsource accounting in most cases. It's better to have a core team. If you can get that from the get-go, that's better. Otherwise, it will be very taxing to one individual and you have the risk, run the risk of that person leaving or something happening and you have a single point of failure, your community fails again. Uh, have only one official communication channel. I've noticed this both in our space and in other spaces. They go, oh, we've got our mailing list, our IRC, we've got Slack, we've got this, we've got that, we've got this, we've got... They have 10, 15 channels. Uh, just choose one that's official and the ex extra ones are just extra. Make sure everybody knows which one is official where the information is going to go. You're also going to have problems with people not wanting to join a certain platform or channel because of principles. For example, for the longest time we didn't have a Facebook account because most of the members didn't want Facebook, they were morally against it. Eventually, there were, it got revoted, there were more people towards having Facebook, we have a Facebook now. But that's not an official communication channel. The mailing list is, and that's it. Uh, yeah, never mix meetings for existing members with new ones. Don't. Take them separately, have an orientation, have some documentation to give them. It will make things run far more smoothly. Uh, preferably have a monthly update, at least. Try to keep governance meetings to a minimum. Most stuff can really be discussed online and most people do not like to move and go have a lot of meetings. It's just, yeah. Uh, don't make rules or guidelines until you actually need them. We started out with six guidelines, we've got eight, and for the most part, we've managed to work out reasonably well, except for the civil war. The first one with be excellent to each other is probably the best guideline ever designed in, in terms of just psychological way of thinking about it. And whenever it seems to go badly, you just go like, yeah, come on guys, remember this, so come on, come on, try. And it would detense things very well in most cases. Uh, okay. If you're going to make a community hackerspace in Romania, 
assume bureaucracy is going to be your first and most major enemy. It will take you about, as it took five months to get our NGO status, uh, you know, fun stuff like getting an Aori number, you need to run a Windows XP machine that runs Internet Explorer 7 with a very old Java applet in order to make the form to get a PDF form sent to you that you go to actually put it off. That kind of fun stuff that's very specific to our lovely country. If you're going to uh, hire consultants, it's going to cost you a lot. Otherwise, ask around and some people might help out. Um, in Romania, both terms are still rather new. Less now, but when we got started about five years ago, they were even within more technical circles, hacker spaces were like, what? Do you know what the hackathon is? Yes, hacker space, no. So we had to fight with the idea of, uh, with the lack of understanding for the concept and also a bit of uh, fear around the term hacker because, yeah, most people know only the media version, which is the <coughs> correct one. Uh, a lot of people also kind of go and they what do you guys do? And they expect the organization to continuously do something like a very clear direction. Let's say we develop this product or we develop this. The whole concept of having a space in the organization's role being to maintain infrastructure for its members is also somewhat novel. Uh, we have no idea how to get in touch to any Romanian academic institutions to partner up or do any of that. If anybody has an idea, I'm very, we're very open to that, I'm very open to that, but probably not going to happen. Uh, other spaces I've been to in around Europe, only visited around Europe, uh, all of us kind of have the same problems. Financing is a major issue for all community spaces. Uh, what I've learned, some of them have done and has worked well for purchasing cheaper equipment, industrial grade or semi-industrial, is uh, liquidation auctions. When a company goes bust or something, the government will auction some of it. That's a good option and I've seen both the guys in Sheffield and Arcos do this with some reasonable success. Uh, whenever you're stuck, reach out to other spaces, other people, ask them, just send an email and you get a ton of information about what they use, what problems they've had, how they've uh, handled a certain problem. So most other spaces are very helping. Uh, yeah, the large successful community spaces mostly have made some sort of partnership with local academia or government, which would be the ideal route usually at least to get the space which is usually the major cost center in this kind of a place, about 50 to more, 50% at least of your cost will be rent, Eucharist or most, most capitals. So if you can fix that one, the risk is way, way, way easier. Uh, financing wise, my conclusions are kind of like this. Look for grants and research projects where there's a capacity and there are people willing to involve themselves in it. Uh, you're going to need for most of these at least one or two years of existence as a legal entity before you can even apply to them. Uh, remember most grants will not deduct salary costs, so you might have research funding or whatever, but you will not get salary costs, so that has to be figured out some way differently. Uh, if it gets to that point, Oh yeah, and if you're looking for sponsorship or something like that, do not go as though you're asking for a handout. You're getting them to support a good cause and part of the future does that too, because otherwise you won't get any financing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so far what we've learned from this, or I've learned from this. If I figure out some better financing options, I'll let you know. That's kind of it for now. As in for future steps, reopen in a couple of months, find more people, scale, 
go to 50 members and 250, 250 meters next time or about. Past that, maybe one more level in scaling up. Don't go past 150 members in a single community, then chapter. If you have bigger communities than 150, usually they kind of dilute themselves and just, there's no feeling of community anymore past 150, 200 people. So just make chapters, and hopefully a few years from now, there's going to be a patch or something very similar in most places. Because that's about it. Thanks. never been anything like that in Romania. Uh, internationally there are various maker fairs or uh, specifically Germany comes to mind with Chaos Computing Congress which is a specific thing for CCC but in Romania there hasn't been any like bigger events to put people together, no, not yet. I'm not sure I got the question, sorry. Uh, what kind of people are you uh, going to go for if there is uh, some, uh, some bigger event here? For instance, who is the best? That really depends on who really wants to show up, but I can tell you what flavor each of the spaces in Bucharest has. Um, currently, there's Inventaza.ro, which doesn't really operate the makerspace anymore, they just have a, they're kind of done with that, they've created an academy for kids. There's Modulab, which is kind of closed circuit, or the ones that did exist when we started. Uh, they mostly do art installations and technical art installations, so that's probably what would be their thing. Uh, Node makerspace is uh, the biggest makerspace in Romania. This has had some serious funding, but it's kind of directed towards um, established designers, uh, small startup tech design companies. They, so yeah, they're a bit more commercial, but they would be somewhere around in the design product area mostly, more maker design product. Uh, Anything? Is there anybody else in Bucharest? No. For now, no. That's the only ones in Bucharest. Laborazon in Brasov is more maker but community. Uh, hackerspace Yash is very code oriented in Yash. Uh, Plan Zero is in Timisoara, but I'm not sure what exactly they're doing because I haven't gone to talk to them or haven't seen much since. Haven't been following. So each of these spaces kind of has a particular flavor. Mm, ours is just as inclusive as possible and we're going to pretty much reflect the wishes of the members. So if we have more artists, it will become more artistic. If we have more coders, it will become more code. We have one artist. I think Which? we're all a bit of artists. Right? He, he started the Civil War? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, Spark, it's your turn. Yes. Oh, and then. When you have somebody come in and offer a business, make sure people know you're not going to take it. What are the hours of operation? What do you, when you close? When we were uh, open, because right now we don't have a physical space, but uh, when we were, we kind of had two fully open periods uh, in the evening. I don't know, was it Monday and Thursday? Monday was mine, Thursday was Lucian's. I had like four hours open for the public and the members could come whenever they wanted. Oh, is, is it members, do they have access 24 hours or? The next space, we should have access 24 hours, but the last one, we couldn't really have it because we were sharing it with somebody else. Yeah. When is the next space going to open? 
hopefully a month and a half. Two tops. I like to be well, I'll give you my card. Write me an email. Yeah, sure. sure. Obviously, if not, come back in a few years and yeah. you will be impressed. <laughs> I, I think a uh, uh, record about you would be a good idea to meet uh, many people with different backgrounds, like uh, mechanics, makers, electronics, uh, developers, uh, designers, artists. It would be. And actually, we're going to, there's a few more things. Uh, if you're going to make a build, I forgot to put that. If you're going to make a build, might as well make an event out of it. You know, like, we're going to be building this tomorrow or this weekend. Also, document your builds because I've noticed that's a problem in most places and spaces. And even the equipment that gets built there, uh, there's a lot. The guys in Arcus had a laser cutter that nobody could use because the guy that built it left and didn't leave any documentation. It got just vaguely busted and everybody's like, uh, I'm not good enough to fix this. <laughs> yeah, apparently nobody got to that part or nobody could. We can so, organize a reverse so we're going to do that. For example, next, when we get the printer kits, we're going to make an event and let us show you how to build a Prusa and try to get more people in. Truth is, we didn't really do much advertising during that time, and probably we're going to start doing some now. The idea was kind of get a core of people that really understand what it's about and why, and see later on what we can do past that, which I thank you guys. Yeah, that's a rough the much. problem with making an event out of the build is that it's quite annoying. Yes. Because you work on something, and you have a bunch of people looking at that with none. It is a bit annoying. So my kind of event would be, see that pile of parts, make something out of it. Well, we could have them make it. We could have them make it. So it's just a... Well, it's not that really depends on what we're talking about, right? Uh, I think there's no more talks because we kind of switched me and um, and the one, sorry. I was thinking who was supposed to be after me and yeah.